been a long road since the original kicker christened that first pickup truck. It kicked off a car audio renaissance, and upgrading your music in a vehicle was a requirement. America's Music Machine became live and loud over your passion, your emotion, your existence. Outdoors or on the open road, your sound is kicker. Do not attempt to adjust this transmission. We have assumed control. The year is 1980. Music fights for its very survival in an acoustically desolate wasteland man calls automobile. Enter Steve Irby, a man whose love of music helped end this scourge forever and forge a path for modern car audio to follow. A humble musician with a passion for quality sound, Mr. Irby is a man who feels it is his destiny to provide a sanctuary for mobile audio. Welcome. Join us this evening as we venture back to the very night a young Steve Irby gains his inspiration to create the legacy we know today as Kicker Performance Audio. Though he does not realize it now, by this time tomorrow, Mr. Irby will have completed blueprints for the original kicker and champion the war against mobile audio inequality. Tonight, Mr. Irby's prayers will be answered as he begins his quest into the Q Zone. Kicker L7QB8. With roots dating back to Kicker's inception, Mr. Irby and his team of engineers have achieved an unrivaled level of design and functionality. With extraordinary base and a minimal footprint, the L7QB8 utilizes a seamless quarter inch extruded aluminum housing, allowing optimal internal air volume for the subwoofer. This exclusive design provides exceptional strength and stability. Like the original Kicker, the L7QB8 incorporates a unique passive radiator to minimize required airspace while optimizing the efficiency and frequency response of the subwoofer. Opposite the passive radiator, the L7QB8 is equipped with the all new 8 inch L7 square subwoofer. The 2016 L7 features an aluminum basket for exceptional strength and thinned aluminum heat sinks for efficient heat dissipation. Kicker's blue lace spider, solo cone 360 degree back bracing, and a laser etched cone brace combine as a single ultra rigid unit. The result is increased clarity, higher volume, and added reliability. The square cone features over 20% more surface area than round subwoofers. It's attached to a Santa Prince surround, then stitched to the cone for long life and durability. This surround features Kicker's patented rib corners, which fully dictates cone motion and extends surround life. At the base of the unit, a pair of custom form flanges integrate seamlessly with an extremely low profile mounting system, consisting simply of a mounting plate and ball. Once installed, the overall height of the enclosure is only nine and a half inches. This profile is small enough to work perfectly in countless trucks, sedans, and SUVs. Once again, Kicker sets a new standard with the groundbreaking design and unparalleled performance of the all new L7 QB8.
just in. Extra low frequencies detected emanating from the heavens. Saucer-shaped objects confirmed all over the world. Unidentified flying K saucer spotted delivering Kicker's amazing new Comp Q super woofer. Built for precision. Built for abuse. Built for the future and benefit of mankind. Kicker's new Comp Q woofer leaves audiences astounded and amazed as it reveals subtleties in their favorite music in a way that is sure to make women blush and grown men cry. The surround features Kicker's variable cross-section high-roll design, allowing extended cone travel and excellent cone control. It's firmly attached to the cone, reinforced with our iconic stitching. Betsy Ross would be so proud. The injection-molded solo cone and laser X cone brace combined in a single ultra-rigid unit. Venting in the brace relieves performance robbing back pressure. All this adds up to very low distortion and amazingly clean low bass. A progressive roll blue lace spider adds even more cone control at maximum excursion. The woven tinsel leads are sandwiched between the spider and the lace for durability and long life and to prosper. The spring terminal's heavy-duty square design accepts wires as big as 8-gauge or two 12-gauge wires for multi-sub installations. The high-temp voice coil is rumored to be spun upon the looms of the gods of polyamide fiberglass, along with a reinforced former for high strength and power handling. Now, add colossal magnets, plus a cavernous bump back plate, an extended pole piece created in a single forging, the likes that haven't been seen since the creation of Pacific. Sidon's trident, and the result is a driver with superior control and effective heat dissipation that extreme performance demands. The all-new Kicker Comp Q is designed from the ground up to deliver everything you demand from a premium subwoofer. High output, deep, powerful, accurate bass, remarkably small enclosure requirements, stunning good looks, and not to mention the ability to frighten small children when turned up to 11. So there you have it, the all-new Kicker Comp Q subwoofer, another zenith of innovation and epic majesty from Kicker. I built my first speaker uh, to be louder. I was playing in a band and the drummer played so loud and the keyboard that I had wouldn't play very loud and I went to my dad and said, I need a bigger speaker. It's a Fender Bandmaster, it cost $300. He dropped the newspaper and said, $300? Yeah, but he didn't say no. He said, is it something that we could build? And so that's how I got started building speakers. The thing that, that I love to see is a product that we made and get to stand back kind of anonymously and watch somebody take a look at it, listen to it, and go, wow. I think that's what really lights my fire is to make products that people enjoy and have fun with. As time went on, I heard people say, you know, Kicker's like a family. I actually didn't set out to do that. Uh, I thought it sounded kind of hokey. I thought they were insincere and in just saying that. After a few years, I realized, uh, yeah, maybe that's, maybe that's what we've got. And that's the key is the good people on your team in the band that makes the band really great. Well, I think Kicker is primarily a lifestyle company. That's a little backwards of where I started. I thought we were a technology company and uh, we would make great products, but as time went on, realized that it's about people and uh, helping people to enjoy their life and what they do. And that's what I do, too. So share the love a little bit, I guess. <laughs>
Good evening, everyone. This is Kip, Kicker Unmasked Live is the show. It's Tuesday night, 7.30. Thank you for tuning in. You know, we'd have a great time putting the show together for you. It is a lot of work. There's a team of us here that scramble around to figure out what we're going to talk about, what demos we're going to bring. But it's a good time, and you guys tuning in makes it all worthwhile. So hope you're all having a good evening tonight. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, we're going to be a little casual here in the beginning. Uh, Ernie, how are you guys doing back there in the control room? Hey, what I need to do is uh, there's a little switch box there next to you, Ernie. That's where the H the SDI feeds come out of the TV. I need you to push the switch because I'm not getting the StreamYard feed. Got it. You know what I'm talking about? It's that little black switch box. There you go. Switch that for me. Bada boom, bada bing. Should roll around. And where's my feed? And where's my feed? All right. Well, I guess switch it back because I'm not getting anything from you now. I'm getting no feed. Getting no there you go. Feed. At least you're back. You I can't see any questions can't or anything on there. For, anything for some reason, it's, it's not set up, guys. Sorry about, about that. that. So uh, that, that means, Jeremy, you're going to have to handle all questions on streamer because I literally can't see anything. Can't see anything. Um, it's uh, not coming it's not through that feed. All I'm getting is the feed from here. It's all to do with that switch box. What it means, the computer has been messed with. It's not set up and sending the feed out. So are you up on screen? I can't tell. Are you on the screen, Ernie? We are on the screen, sir. So, so for those of you out there, I can't see that the, there's a little snafu here. I can't actually see what's going out to StreamYard. All I can see is my ugly mug up on the screen. I can't see those guys. So uh, you guys, uh, you know, we've got another habit around here. We actually get together. Uh, we put all the materials together for this show. Uh, we also do it here at 7.30 uh, Central Time. So that's actually what has dinner time for us. And tonight, they've kind of made me the impromptu guy who has to choose what we're going to eat on every Tuesday night. And tonight, my selection was of all things, five guys burgers. And so, uh, hey, tell me, uh, how was your burger, guys? How was your burger, guys? Mine was great, kid. What'd you have on it? Well, I had some cheese, some bacon. That sounds a like I had. I had jalapenos and I had some uh, grilled mushrooms on mine. Ernie, what'd you have besides a burger? Ernie, what'd you have besides a burger? Gosh, man, I thought it was going to be a double. It ended up being a triple because um, that's what they do at Five Guys. Um, little jalapenos, mustard, uh, tomatoes, you know, had the, had the, uh, what, the Cajun fries. I think everybody had that, so it was, it was outstanding. You know, that was the first time I've tried their Cajun fries, Ernie, and I think you and I agreed on earlier. Those things were awesome. There was just the right amount of spice level that you knew it was there, but it wasn't. I mean, I've had a lot of seasoned fries before that just taste fake or they don't taste good. Uh, I thought those were pretty excellent tonight. You know, it's, it's kind of funny. Uh, Ernie, he's like, okay, where are we going? So we said we're going to go have dinner. And Ernie's placing the order and everything ready. And Ernie either didn't know or forgot that, you know, a standard burger at Five Guys, you get two patties of beef right off the start. It's not like you have to order a double. You just get a double. And if you want just one patty of beef, you have to ask. I think they call it a little cheeseburger, if I remember right, is what it is as well. So Ernie and Jeremy, who those guys, they like to eat. I mean, I like to eat too, but I normally just get a single patty burger and away I go. But Ernie ordered the regular burgers for everyone, but they wanted to have two patties, so they ordered extra patties. So they actually ended up with three patties on their burgers. So they were. <laughs> I think Ernie and Jeremy, you guys actually had to leave some food on the plate, if I remember right. <laughs> you don't know that you. I'll, I'll keep an eye on you guys occasionally. And of course, we can't really. Hey, Ernie, can you go to the? Uh, can you go to the overhead feed? Kind of give the room feed. Can you bring that camera up as well? Sure. Bring, bring that up. I'll make you work for your dinner tonight. So, hi, hey everyone. I'm gonna turn around. Hey everyone. This is obviously the overhead shot to the studio here. We put things together. Normally. This is our conference room. It's where Kicker does all of our meetings for the employees or any big to-do, like if it's you know for the United Way or any of the other fundraisers we have going on. This is really where all the employees come together to do those. And of course, with COVID going on, we weren't getting together in large groups. So this has been turned into our studio. And as Ernie and Jeremy and Tim and myself like to joke about, and even Bill Frog is, you know, the company doesn't need to have a new studio. They just need to go find a new conference room because we've acquired this and this is ours so that we can keep doing this feed for you guys every Tuesday night. And, <laughs> yeah, he does. Steve says we are squatting on his property, but you know what? He hasn't kicked us out yet, has he? <laughs> and, you know, so that overhead feed, I was hoping you can see, is obviously Tim, who's our camera guy. Hey, give me a holler, Tim. Hey, what's going on, Kip? I'm sure you guys can probably pick him up a little bit from my mic, but Tim... You know, as you uh, we went through the beginning, you know, Tim started off his career in the company and actually spends a lot of his day back in special operations, which is actually designing and building audio systems, special projects, car audio systems. Uh, they'll get involved in doing some really tricked out, unique stuff for a lot of our influencers that are out there. So 
he got kind of pulled into this because we needed help. We needed someone to help move cameras and kind of set them up. And ironically, Tim has turned into quite the cameraman. It's a, it must be a second skill set he didn't know he had. So normally you have to have a person on every camera. I don't know if you noticed from the overhead feed, but we actually have three cameras down here that are feeding this out to you. And Tim is actually controlling all three of them. So if we want to do a close-up shot of a product or anything like that, he can control that. So I like giving him a shout out because he's the guy behind the scenes who doesn't get a lot of love. So Tim, thank you for all your efforts, what you do here for us. Not a problem, not a problem. You know, and, and guys, we really do love putting this show together for you. Tonight's show, when we get into it, we'll do a little housekeeping here tonight. When we get into tonight's show, what it's going to be about is Kicker's approach to integration and some of the obstacles and problems that you have to overcome in modern day vehicles. Some of those uh, obstacles have existed for a long time. They've just evolved and turned into different things. And we're going to discuss what a couple of those key ones are the solutions that you can use to attack those problems, and then we're going to show you the actual Kicker products where we've integrated those type of solutions so that you can see exactly what's going on in that product and how you can use it in an application for your own personal vehicle, or if you're doing an install for someone, because we do have people tune in who are installers during the day. Great way for you to find out information about those Kicker products you're selling on a daily basis is obviously right here on Kicker Unmasked Live. This is a show that we take to everyone, so the information we're giving out here, it's the same info we would give a dealer, it's the same info we would give you guys out here in consumer land, so we hope you appreciate that and we hope you enjoy it. If you have questions about anything we're going to cover tonight, be sure you pop those down into the comment feed. Uh, we do know that there are streams coming in for both Facebook and YouTube, and there is a little bit of delay on that. We learned a lesson last week, and we apologize to anyone. There's one particular gentleman, uh, we apologize to him profusely. But obviously, with the delay between Facebook and YouTube, what comes into StreamYard? Hey, there's my big feed. I can actually see questions now. All right, let's give it up for the guys in the control room. They got it going. So, you know, what's going on is StreamYard brings in the feed from YouTube and Facebook and brings it into one consolidated stream and then dumps it into here so we can control it, look at it, and feed it. And so last week, we said the first comment that shows up, that would be the winner of the T-shirt. Well, obviously, that was our bad. We didn't take into account that there's actually a delay on Facebook versus YouTube. So some of you actually are seeing it delayed a little bit versus it being live. So what we've decided is going forward, whenever we do any type of an instant drawing or giveaway like that, we're actually going to take two winners. So it's actually good for you because now instead of one winner per drawing contest, it's going to be two. And what it'll be is we'll take the first Facebook comment that pops up on StreamYard, and then we will also take the first YouTube comment that pops up on StreamYard. And that way, at least because of the delay on whichever one you're watching, everyone gets a fair shot, whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, to enter into these contests and try to win something. So that is a lesson we learned last week. That's what we're going to do going forward is we will take the first one from each of those different ones, Facebook and YouTube, as they pop up into StreamYard, and then we will announce winners from that there. So hopefully you guys appreciate that. And it's a few more t-shirts out of our budget, but we're willing to do it. That way everyone kind of gets a fair shake, and it doesn't matter whether you're watching on Facebook or on YouTube, you're going to have a chance to enter that contest and win, and the person who's getting the, the early feed or the non-delayed feed doesn't get uh, an advantage. So hopefully you appreciate that. With that said, I do want to cover another, or cover another housekeeping tip right here. You know, we do have the quad box giveaway going on right now. We started that. You know, Tim mentioned it. We're actually doing the drawing for that on this show live next Tuesday, and that'll be four weeks from when we launch that contest. And, and Tim was even commenting, he said, I, I can't believe that it's clicked off that fast. It's actually been almost four weeks for that contest, but it has. It's gonna be really fun. Derek from Williston Audio Labs, he's obviously the guy that we did the collab with that. He produced the unboxing video and did the testing in his own vehicle. Not an SPL guy, which is great because it's really not an SPL box. It's a demo box. It's a great sounding box. And it was really good to have Derek do that video to show you guys the potential of the quad box. But we're going to be uh, going on him streaming live next Tuesday, 730. And we will be announcing the winners because there's actually other prizes that come along in that contest. It'll be the grand prize. And I think there's 12 other prizes that come along. So there's a lot of chances to win. There's only one big chance to win the quad box in the full system, but we're going to announce those winners live on Kicker Unmasked. That'll be next Tuesday, 730 Central Time, because we have made that basically our home for the show. And I'm just I'm talking to Ernie because I've completely lost the feed from camera two. I know that I don't know if you're getting an audio feed from me. There we go. I'm back. I'll just move over here to camera three. Sorry for that, folks. I could tell the feed went away. Ernie's back there. Like he said, he ate too much and he's sleeping at the wheel. So next time we're going to make sure he gets one hamburger patty and not three because he's, he's over full. 
So with that said, you know, to enter that contest, I know Bill, uh, he's not in the room here with us, but Bill Frog, as we call him, he's our social guy. He is monitoring this. He's here to answer questions. He's taking all the information. He's going to post, and Bill, if you don't have it, I know you can grab it, but post that link in the comments feed for all these people. If you haven't gone and entered into the Quad Box contest, you need to go hit that. It's Williston Audio Labs. That's where the video is hosted. And in the description box, it has the link for you to come back around to the contest entry form at kicker.com, and you can enter that contest. Ernie, show me the, uh, I don't care which one. There you go. That's the one I'd like to see. Roll that one for me. So that's the Kicker Quad Box giveaway. That's what we're going to have going on. That's going to finalize up, do the drawing next Tuesday. So hopefully everyone will tune in for that and watch that. Ernie, you got something going on. I got a black screen up here. I don't know what you got. There you go. That's, that's better. I, I, you're losing some stuff back there. I don't know what you got going on, but uh, at least I'm back now. I can see myself. So we've got that going on. That drawing, will, like I said, will be next Tuesday for the quad box giveaway. Be sure to run over and hit Williston Audio Labs. Check out the video if you haven't already. Enter that contest. And remember, the way that system works, it's basically when you enter, it's like getting raffle tickets. And there's multiple ways to enter. So if you want multiple chances, just do the different things that the contest says that you can do. And you can have lots of ways to try to win that kicker quad box system that obviously if you saw the original video, we're doing in conjunction with Brandon and Robert from D&B Sales. They kind of climbed on board. And what they're saying is, hey, let's add some speakers to the mix. So I have to give them credit. They were simply tuning in with us and having fun about the quad box. But Brandon and Robert actually upped the stakes on that contest. And so the winner of this, it's going to be pretty amazing. You're getting the quad box. You're getting a KXA 2400.1 amplifier to drive it. You're getting a full one aught PKD1 wiring kit from Kicker to power it up. Then Brandon and Robert, who played chess and kind of won up that game, they added front and rear speakers. So you're going to get some KS front and rear speakers for your vehicle that fit. And I said, well, if you're going to do that, you've got to have an amplifier to drive those speakers. So then we went ahead and added on top a CX 360.4 amplifier so you can drive those speakers. So it's really a complete full system. It's not just a quad box giveaway anymore. It's really a whole system around a quad box. And if you happen to be close enough to Fort Wayne, Indiana, where DNB Sales is located, they've offered to do the install for free as part of this package. So I really got to give them props. DNB Sales in Fort Wayne, Indiana, they really upped the game. They stepped up. They added some more prizes to this package to make it even more fun for you guys. And if you're close enough to them, they'll even do the install for free. And I know you guys out there are, are just a little crazy like I am. I got a feeling even if someone wins this and they're just a little far away, I bet they'll do a travel video, show how much fun they're having going to Fort Wayne, Indiana, and have the guys take care of them there. We'll cross that bridge when we get to it and figure out where we need to send everything so they can get it installed when we actually get the winner next Tuesday. So with that said, the show tonight, we're going to focus on some topics. And the good news is you're going to quit looking at my ugly mug. And I'm actually going to go over to a, uh, a Surface tablet that's been put in as like a camera. And I can actually draw on it and show you things. And there's really three key things I'm going to touch on and do drawing-wise. And we just pictures and diagrams it just seemed easier to do this on the fly talk about it as we show it so Ernie if you could I'd like for you to bring up the surface tablet when I see it's up and running I'm going to move over and I'm going to start doing some things on that puppy but basically there we go let me touch it hey look at that it's up and live so hopefully everyone can still hear me but you can't see me I'm sure at some point Ernie and Tim are going to have a great time playing with picture and picture and all sorts of other fun things to make fun of me uh, just watch it I'm sure it's going to be good so the, the ones I want to talk about, you know, is basically the kicker integration philosophy and the things that go along with it. So, you know, I can remember back a long time ago, hey, Dernie, bring me back to camera there. That's perfect. Do it just like that. I want that right there. Appreciate that. So, you know, I've been with Kicker a long time. I mean, I'm actually in my 25th year here at Kicker. There's a lot of us have been with the company a long time. And I've been here long enough that I've actually had the, the dealers and the consumers and the reps say, when are you guys going to come out? I want my Kicker CD player. When are you going to make a head unit? And I remember back far enough that we would all sit around and, and we would kind of joke about it and laugh and go, well, you know, we're Kicker and we're just not going to probably get into head units. And there, there was actually a lot of reasons why we said we weren't going to get into head units. And it's because of our relationship with working with the OEs, which are the car manufacturers. We saw where technology was going. We saw where the integration level of head units were going in that market. And we knew that it was really not going to be a market that was going to be conducive 
to making aftermarket head units, at least not for us. It'd be a whole lot of investment to get into tooling, uh, doing all that vertical integration so we would make head units because we knew as cars were coming down the pike, we saw what was happening and that the integration, the tightly integrated screens that were coming, the steering wheel controls and everything that comes along for the ride. Uh, as you know, some cars today are very difficult to change the head unit in if you can even do it at all or they require very expensive dash kits. So our philosophy was we know where the market's going as far as automobiles and the source units, so let's not get into the head unit game. Now the funny thing about that is, I've been here long enough now that I get to eat my words with dinner a lot, is we do make head units now. It's just that it's power sports and marine head units. So we do make source units that work in boats. We make source units that guys use all the time in, in uh, UTVs and ATVs. And guys who are doing rods and customs rebuilds, they do use our KM uh, series of radios for our marine line to put source units in those vehicles because they're nice and compact. They have very nice colorful screens on them. They have tons of features. So we do, I can now eat my words, yes, we make a head unit, but it's not a head unit in the conventional sense. It's not a double din or a single din head unit. And you more than likely, I hope I don't get to eat these words as well, I don't think you'll ever see one of those coming from Kicker. And it's because of that we saw what was coming in the car and we knew that it really wasn't a market we wanted to get into. But what does go along with that is we knew then we're going to have to get really good at figuring out ways so people can keep integrating their amplifiers and their speakers into these more advanced car systems as they come along. So with that said, I want to go down and there's really three key things I want to touch on uh, that will make, help make sense why we do the things we do. Kicker does have a philosophy and how we approach integration and it's based our relationship and our information that we get from working with the OEs. And so I really want to touch on these things and I'm going to use the tablet here to hopefully show you guys some valuable information. Now the first one I'm going to show here and this may be, some of you out there may be going, oh yeah, I already know that, it's no big deal. And some of you may be going, oh, I didn't know that. So hopefully there's a mix of you out there. Some find this informative, some may find it as a refresher. But the biggest thing, the first one is, gain on an amplifier versus its output power. So let's just pull out of the air a make-believe 100 watt amplifier. So I'm going to make a 100 watt amplifier here on my screen. Okay, and so if you look at the swing from positive to negative, that's your voltage swing, and you calculate that out, we have our myst mystical, magical 100 watt amplifier. Now, an amplifier, it's really kind of funny what it is. It does exactly what its name implies. It amplifies. You send any signal into it, whatever size it is, and its job is to make that signal bigger. It's a bigger voltage swing. Bigger voltage swing means the speaker moves farther. The speaker moves farther means you get more sound, more output. Well, the thing with a gain knob, if I got a gain knob, I set it there, and I set it there, and I set it there, so let's just call this right here the seven o'clock position, let's call this the 11 o'clock position, and let's call this one right here the four o'clock position. Okay, so this is basically all the way down, this could be considered, this, this one here could be down, and this could be like in the middle, and this could be all the way up. It does not matter where your gain is set, whether you have the gain turned all the way down, whether you have the gain in the middle, or you have the gain turned all the way up, this never changes. It is always a 100 watt amplifier. Gain controls do not change the size of the amplifier. So what are gain controls for? Well, gain controls are there because every single head unit that exists out there has different output voltages that it's capable of producing. Whether it's uh, RCA voltage, maybe a half a volt, which there are even head units today that some struggle to do that. Uh, whether it's two volts, four volts, or even let's talk speaker leads because we're gonna get into that more in just a second as far as why we to go that part. As long as this control is set, and let's just pretend for a second that this one is set right here, let's just call that one volt. So what that means, if I put one volt of signal into that amplifier with that gain knob set there, I'm gonna get 100 watts of power. If I come over to here and I've turned the gain up, let's just pretend that we're gonna call that right there, uh, let's go half a volt. Well, what that means, if I put a half a volt of signal into that amplifier's RCA leads, I'm gonna get 100 watts out of that amplifier. And let's go over here, we got the gain turned really all the way up, it's very sensitive. Let's say this is a 10th of a volt, let's say it's 0 0.1, 0 0.1 of a volt. That's very, very, very sensitive on the amplifier. It's not gonna take a whole lot to drive it, but that amplifier is still only going to make 100 watts of power. So when you're looking at this, 
gain controls, the reason they're adjustable, I mean, it'd be a perfect world if all radios and all source units all put out the exact same maximum voltage, then anyone who makes a car amplifier would just not put gain controls on them. We would just know that it's a fixed voltage we have to deal with, and there would be no gain controls on the end of an amplifier, and you would just hook it up, and it would always just make the power as you turn your knob on your radio. But that's not the case. All radios are different. It's a vastly wide range of input voltages, and so that's why gain controls have to exist. If you turn a gain control up too far and you drive signal into it beyond that, you don't necessarily get more clean power. You can start getting into what's called clipping, which I'm gonna draw it right on top of here, which is where you start square waving off your signal. And that square wave, if you look at that, right inside there, and right inside here, and down in here, and over in here, that is considered power. I mean, it is more power, but you notice that the wave doesn't really move up any higher. You're just squaring it off, as you can see right here. And so that's what happens when you put more voltage into or overdrive the gain of your amplifier beyond what you have the gain set to handle properly. Just understand gain controls, when set properly, doesn't matter where they're set, you set the gain control based on the source driving the amplifier. No matter where you put the gain control, the power of that amplifier never changes, it always stays the same. And that concept is important that you understand that, that gain does not change amplifier power. Now, to go along with that, I'm gonna clean this here and go to a new note. Drag that over, just throw that one away. This is why this is important. You want to make sure that your amplifier's gain is properly matched to whatever you are driving it with so that you get maximum sound quality, maximum signal to noise ratio. If you have the gain on your amplifier set too low versus whatever your unit is driving, you may not get full output out of it because you can't drive enough voltage to get to that 100 watt rating that the amp can make. If the gain is set way too high, what will happen is you'll find that on your radio, there's very few clicks to go from all the way down or quiet to full volume. There's no range. It might be three to five or seven volume clicks and you've used up all the power. It's because your gain is set way too high. It's too sensitive. And you get this noise that comes along. I'm sure a lot of you have heard this. You get a system, turn the volume all the way down. You sit in the car and what you hear is shh. Or the turn signal's blinking or you when you press on the brakes or any of those type of noises that can come along for the ride because those are induced noises into the car's electrical system. So the point is, if the gain is properly set, you wanna make sure, and I'm gonna draw another one here on the screen. So if I, you're got, oh, thank you or anything, that's what I was gonna look up for you. Make sure you're drawing on my screen right there. Okay, if you're looking, I've got that little squiggly on there, that represents noise, basically. And so, if you've got noise sitting here on your, in your car, and you've got your gain set, so you've got the gain in your amplifier turned way, way, way up, so it takes very little signal to drive that amplifier output, so you're using very little signal. Look how much noise there is imposed upon your actual signal. Now, if you set the gain properly so that your radio has full dynamic range, you can use all the volume knob, and it takes more signal from your radio to get the amp to its 100 watt rating, then what happens is you see this. And if you'll notice, see how much more signal there is versus the noise. And ironically, if you've ever looked at an amplifier and you've looked at one of the ratings on it, which is called SN, that's signal to noise, that's telling you what's the difference between the signal, which is what I want, versus the noise that the amplifier the electronics produce. All electronics produce noise, they just all do. You just wanna make sure that your noise level is significantly lower than your typical operating range so that you don't constantly hear that white noise type shh or other noises that can come along for the ride. So a properly set gain control in your amplifier minimizes that noise and minimizes any of the other strange noises that may come along for the ride in your vehicle. So setting gains is vitally important that they are set properly. Now there's lots of tools out there to do it. We have tones and things available at kicker.com. There's lots of, uh, you, if you can get an O-scope, you can get uh, uh, SMD, uh, Steve Mead Designs. They sell some products that allow you to set the gain on your things properly. Uh, they're, they're little handheld meters that actually will tell you when you have reached clipping or when you set the gain properly. There's lots of devices. Old schoolers like Ernie and I, we can, we tell you we can, and we're pretty good at it, but you know, we can run a 1K tone in the car and kind of listen with our ears and we can really get pretty close, but we've been doing it for a very, very long time. And when I want to make sure it's done properly, I always reach for some kind of tool. And that's also why if you look at like our KX line of amplifiers, we actually have a little light that sits right behind the gain knob that'll let you know when the gain is set properly. It's a visual indicator. It's a, basically a built-in test tool so you can get that set properly. So that's why that's important.
Now I'm going to move along. Ernie, if you'll go back to my tablet for me, sir. The next thing I want to talk about, you know, we talked about gain and setting and how it's important, how proper gain setting is important because it lets you get the maximum sound quality out of your system with the minimum noise. The next thing comes down to speaker leads versus RCA outputs in a modern deck. And so I want to, want to kind of shoot some holes and some, and some maybe uh, some things that some people out there may believe they're incorrect. And the first one is, you know, there used to be a time, a long time ago, where if you looked at amplifiers back in the day, the only way that anyone would tell you to get a signal into an amplifier is they would say, RCAs, 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 you got to use RCAs. There's no other way to get a good signal into your deck and from your deck to your amp, you got to use RCA cables. And I was one of those guys, and back in the day, that was kind of true. But what's happened is, is we've evolved and moved forward. You know, we talked about you know, that signal and noise thing, trying to get the most out of your system. Back in my day, we actually used things called line drivers. You can still find them today if you want to, but what a line driver is, it's a fancy name for a RCA, or a low voltage amplifier. So you're actually taking your, your quarter volt, your half volt, your one volt, which were pretty typical RCA voltages back in the day, and a line driver would increase that voltage to four volts, eight volts, some of them mean a little bit higher than that, but it basically gave you much more voltage coming from your radio, and what that allowed you to do is turn the gains down on your amplifiers, you still get the same power out of your amplifiers, but now that you're driving a stronger signal back, you get better signal to noise ratio. So all those noises, the, the white no noise sound, the shh sound, all that stuff would just basically go away. It was still there, but at such a low level you can't hear it. And that's what you're doing with signal noise ratio. You're trying to make your signal much greater than the noise, so you just don't hear it. So in today's, if you look at what goes on, you take, and I'm not gonna pick on any one company because it doesn't matter, but you take any um, below, $600-ish probably, may even be a little bit higher than that today, radio that has speaker leads and RCA outputs. And what they've done today is in most of those cases, the RCA outputs are not a dedicated true preamp out. So back in the day when there used to be a dedicated true preamp out, and there were a lot of companies that bragged and boasted about, you know, four volt and eight volt output. I mean, those were dedicated true high voltage preamp outputs. What's happened today is they basically pull that out, and what you do is they've come off of the speaker lead, so inside of all radios today there's a little chip amplifier, and it comes out and drives your speaker leads, but what they've done is they basically have thrown some resistors into the heat sink on the back of the radio so it can pull that heat away, and they drop the voltage down and tag it to a couple of RCA cables. So it is an RCA output, but it's not a true RCA preamp. Now the only thing that is bad about that is you're basically taking half your signal, driving it through a resistor to pull heat away, or pull signal away, pull voltage away, and it has turned into heat, and it also imbalances the RCA signal just slightly. It doesn't really affect sound quality too much, but why would you start off with, say, a good solid 10 volt signal coming out your speaker leads, and then drop that down to, say, 2 volts coming out your RCAs, and then have all that heat waste on the back of your deck? Wouldn't you rather take that 10 volts and drive it to your amplifier? No need to knock it down. And a lot of these decks out there, if you've played around with them, no speaker leads hooked up, you're just using the RCAs, but the back of the radio still gets really hot. It's just because it's those resistors that are eating up that energy to knock that speaker lead signal down to an RCA signal. So I'm gonna draw on the screen here, Ernie. If you'll bring up my screen for me here, please. You know, basically, if you look at this, I'm gonna draw, doo -doo -doo -doo, draw this. And then I'm going to draw this, and then just like the one before, there's some noise that happens to exist there on the line. The, the frequency response up to clipping between your speaker leads out of a deck today versus the RC outs of a deck today, it's the same. There used to be a time that maybe the speaker leads would not quite be as full frequency range or as full bodied as a true preamp out, but those days were a long time ago and those days don't exist today. So up until you get to clipping, until you do this, whether you do it here or here, it's the same signal. The difference is if you look at this, let's just say this is the speaker leads out here, let's just call that 10 volts. And let's go over here and let's say that's two volts. So basically, you wasted eight volts right here by dropping the signal down so you could go to two volts to feed those to your amplifier. Wouldn't it be a whole lot better if you could take 10 volts and feed it directly into your amplifier? No, no, no lock, no line output converter, nothing like that. I mean, literally take the 10 volts from your radio 
and send it straight into your amplifier. Because again, your amplifier is literally just doing that. It amplifies. So if I've got 10 volts, and let's just break it down to voltage. Let's say my, where I want to go is 100 volts. I want my amplifier to give me 100 volts. Well here, I've got to multiply this by 10. My amplifier's got to do 10 times the work to get there, which means it's amplifying everything 10 times. If I go over here to 2 volts, I've got to do everything by 50 times. And it's doing everything 50 times, including the noise. So if you can drive a much hotter signal straight into your amplifier, you're going to get better signal noise ratio. You're going to get the same power, because remember, no matter where you set the gain, as long as it's set properly, the amplifier output power does not change. It's the same power. But if you can drive more signal back to your amplifier, you can now turn your gain on your amplifier down, still get all your power out of your amplifier, and you get better signal to noise ratio. You know, we keep coming back to that. We're trying to eliminate noises that are in your car. We're trying to eliminate any noise that might be right on the chassis of your car, any noise that might be coming out of a computer module or a brake module or anything in your car. We don't want those to be part of what you're hearing. And Kicker cares about those things. So we design electronics to get around that. And we're going to talk to you about the solutions that let you implement these ideas we're talking about here in just a minute. So that's the next one is speaker leads versus RC outputs. Sure looks like it makes a lot of sense if you can use RCA speaker leads or speaker leads direct into your amplifier versus an RCA if I get more signal. At least that's what it looks like on my tablet. Ernie, let's go back to my tablet again. I'm going to bring up another screen. The next thing I want to talk about is a, a topic that's called differential inputs. And again, I'm going to draw on this screen. You guys are going to get tired of seeing wavy lines here from me. If there's noise, riding along here, that means that noise is also on here. That noise exists on there. Now if I amplify that signal as it is, and I amplify it, all this noise that's on there, when I make that signal bigger through my amplifier, because that's what it does, an amplifier just makes a small voltage signal a bigger voltage signal, not only is my music and what I'm playing, my signal, what I really want to hear getting bigger and amplified, but guess what? So is the noise. The noise gets amplified just the same as the signal itself. That's a bad thing. We want to find a way to get around that. And what's been used in years, and, and some guys out there, I mean, I follow, I certainly can't say I follow them all, but I read a lot of the stuff you guys post in forums and follow Kicker. And, you know, uh, in pro sound, there's a thing called XLR or uh, tip ring sleeve. It's a quarter inch jack, but it's basically a balance signal, meaning there's really a shield and then there's a positive and a negative. And in that pro sound world, the reason they use balance is because it allows them to run very, very small signals like from a microphone or a guitar pickup or a microphone on a drum kit or anything like that. They can run at 50, 70, 100, 150 feet to a mixing console and they can get a good signal and that balanced cable eliminates any induced noise that could be coming from other cables laying on the floor, lighting circuits, anything that may be around there. It helps eliminate that noise from coming in and being part of the music, which is what we're trying to do is get rid of that. So on the car side, you know, years back there's been some experimentation. Some people tried to send the signal from the front to the back with an adapter that actually turned it into coax or fiber optic digital. Uh, there was a, I think it was Phoenix Gold for a while. They actually made and tried to use mini XLRs and convert basically from the radio into an XLR balance signal and then you'd transmit that cable back to the back and you'd have to have a receiver that wouldn't take the XLR because you got to turn it back into RCA cables to go into your amplifiers. So you can add things to make that long distance haul from front to back, but you're still converting on both ends back into what's called a single ended, which means the RCAs are common grounded. They just reference to chassis ground through typically a 1K resistor, but it can vary, so don't hold me to that. But they are just reference to ground. They're common grounded, single ended. So what we got going on is and we've been doing it for probably, I'm going to go back and say probably the last 10, 12 years, and we've moved it into basically any amplifier from Kicker today have this. And what it's called, it's called differential inputs. And differential input, not that I'm trying to confuse you guys out there, never, never land, but basically it's an op amp. And what we do is we're basically taking and looking at the signal, and we're inverting one and comparing it to the other. And so in my example here that you guys can see going along, that noise that's there that's being induced, whether it's through the power supply or chassis ground or off the chassis floor into the cables, wherever it's coming from, that noise exists on the positive and the negative line at the same time. If we have, and if you just think of that noise as plus one, it's just noise, it's just a positive, let's just call it plus one. That's your noise. 
If I go through a differential op amp and I invert one of those channels and they both have plus one noise on them, but now I invert one, that one side becomes minus one noise, okay? Real easy. And if I take plus one and minus one and I sum them together or look at the difference, the result's zero. I effectively eliminate the noise that the cables or the car are inducing into the audio system. So differential inputs are a fantastic thing to have in your gear. It allows you to get a very clean signal from the front of your car to the back of your car, and any of that noise that might get picked up along the way, it just gets eliminated. The cool part is differential inputs don't require you to change away from the old standard we're all used to, which is RCA cables. You can still use RCAs plugged into your head unit. You can still use RCAs plugged into your amplifier because all this differential input technology is happening in the amplifier and in the preamp in the amplifier to do that. Now, the one thing that's really cool about this, and I'm going to, you're going to get tired of me drawing pictures, Ernie. I'm actually having kind of fun. I feel like I'm back in preschool. But when you're doing a system, and, and I will say this, if you're really concerned about noise, if you're looking to get the most sound quality out of your system, you don't want noises and pops and ticks and all that stuff, you really want to use twisted pair cabling uh, or twisted pair RCA cables. And the difference between two, when I say twisted pair versus anything else, is anything else that you might be familiar with is basically a coax cable. And in a coax cable, your positive is in your center pin, your outside has braided or shielding on it that travels all over the cable, and that cabling comes out and that goes to your negative. And that's, that's called a coax cable. Most all RCA cables are this design. They're, they still are designed this way today. But in a twisted RCA cable design, what happens is you've got the cables are actually intertwined or twisted together, and one is a positive and one is a negative. And then those are just housed inside your outer sheath of your RCA, and then they come down here, connect to the center pin and the ground. This type of cable right here is better all the way around for uh, rejecting and not picking up noise that may exist in your automobile, number one. And number two, this type of cable is gonna give you the maximum performance with a differential operational amp amplifier. And so this is important here because these are really three key things that if you look at what we're dealing with, and it kind of goes back to kicker, seeing what was coming down the highway and knowing where we need to go, is we're not gonna be seeing a lot of head units with RCAs that we need to interface with going in the future. We're gonna see a lot of radios with speaker leads that we need to interface going into the future. And so that moves us into what I want to talk about next, which is, Ernie, if you'll bring a slide up on the screen, it should be your very first slide. I think it's fit. At least I hope it is, unless I've, unless I've handicapped you and put you in the wrong spot or I've talked beyond what I knew I wanted to show. But the first slide coming up. Oh, actually, no, Ernie. I want to back up a second. Show me the, uh, the amplifier pick. That should be pick number one. It should be amp pick. I think that's why I labeled it, or you'll see it there. I need to see that one right up first. Okay. Ernie's had way too many hamburgers tonight. I think three patties is beyond his uh, capability to, to have. <laughs> but I want to show you. Uh, wrong one. Go to the next one. It, it's, it's the amplifier pick. It's a, pick of, it's a black amplifier. It's the end panel of an amplifier. There you go, that's what I wanted to see. Thank you, sir. So basically, what I'm talking about here, guys, and we've kind of led to this conversation, this is a picture, and, and I, I blurred out the brand because it doesn't matter what brand, everyone, including us back in the day, did this. As you can see, there's an RCA input, and then right next to it is a thing called high level. And basically, in the day, what was happening is, people wanted to be able to interface to their factory radios. Even back in, you know, if you go back as far as the mid 80s, it started happening then and going up from there. But you couldn't run a signal into the RCAs because that was a single-ended balanced input, or not balanced, just a single-ended common ground input. They wanted to take speaker leads into the amplifier. So basically built into the amplifier was a line output converter. And I'm sure all you are familiar with those, you've seen them. Ernie, if you can, the next picture I'd like you to show is actually a line output converter. It's a picture one from back in the day. It should be the very next slide up there on the asset list. But what a line output converter would do is it would basically take your left and right channels because they're not, the grounds aren't common, they're floating. And it would go into this little box, and you can see it's an inductor and a couple of resistors to pad it down. And this box would then take the signal from the speaker leads, uncouple it 
and make sure it's isolated from chassis ground because when you go to the RCAs, those are common ground. We just can't take the negatives and the positive from the speaker leads and short them together. So basically this would decouple those grounds, allow them to float, bring them together through a couple isolation transformers, and then give you an RCA output signal. So back in the early days, you could buy an adjustable uh, A-lock. We always called them A-locks for adjustable line output converter. Sometimes they were just lock, which meant line output converter. They weren't adjustable. There were no pots so you could adjust the signal. They were just fixed. But line output converters started off as the way you could get any factory radio or even aftermarket radio, because back in the day, some radios didn't have RC outputs. It's how you could get those speaker leads into your amplifier. But when you go through a device like that, it does affect the frequency response of what you get. And we actually have a pretty cool demo. I don't want to get into it too deep right now because I got a demo to show you that I think is going to blow your minds when you actually see what an A-lock or a line output converter does to a full range signal. So I'm, I'm just touching on it here. We've got a demo set up over here on the computer I'm going to show you and it really helps bring that point home. You guys will go like, okay. I get it, I don't want to use a line output converter and here's why. But we'll get to that in just a second. So that's really old school, that's the way things went. Amplifiers had to have high level inputs or you had to use a line output converter because there was no way to get speaker leads directly into that amplifier. So you had to insert something and make a sacrifice to get that signal into the aftermarket amplifier from the factory radio or the aftermarket radio if it, not, if it did not have RCAs. So with that said, Ernie, I am now ready for you to bring up the fit slide. And I honestly promise you that should be the very next asset you've got up there. Go ahead and take that one full screen. It should be talking about fit, fit plus. Yeah, and leave that up on the screen with you for a few minutes, if you will, Ernie. So this brings us to, you know, we've, we've talked about the key things, uh, the things that we saw as obstacles moving forward, the things that get in the way of sound quality, the way things that get in the way of interfacing from Kicker's viewpoint. And so this brings us down to really Kicker's approach to factory integration is we know we want to have the gain set properly so you don't have noise. We know that you want to be able to use speaker leads because factory radios do not provide RCA outputs. And we know we want to get rid of as much noise as possible. And so we're going to use differential inputs to cancel some of that noise out along the way. But the other cool thing that differential inputs allows us to do, and that ties right back in here into FIT, and what FIT is, FIT stands for Failsafe Integration Technology. And it's Kicker's uh, acronym, and it's our technology, where basically we roll these technologies up and go, listen, we have an RCA input on our amplifier. It is a differential input. And any of you out there, if you'd like to, you can take a voltmeter, go to any Kicker amplifier that's been made in about the last 10 years, and look, and you'll notice that there's no continuity between the RCA shield and ground on our amplifiers. It's totally isolated. And that's one of the things with the differential input. And by doing that with the differential input, what that allows us to do is we can literally take speaker leads and take speaker wire directly into the RCA jacks on the end panel of our amplifiers that are equipped with FIT. Now as you go down the list there on FIT, you'll see the very first technology we came out with was, was FIT, it was just called FIT, and it allowed for a 10 volt input signal. And when we came out with FIT, originally, 10 volt was plenty to handle any of the radios that were out in the market at that time frame. If you fast forward to FIT 2, you'll notice that it still stayed at 10 volt because at that time 10 volt still handled factory and aftermarket radios as far as getting signal into the RCA leads directly. But we had to do some switching around and do some things because the factory, they kind of changed the DC offset because another cool component of FIT is you don't need to find a remote turn on. You can simply take the speaker leads directly into the amplifier and when that amplifier sees signal on the diff input, the amplifier turns on because it sees the differential or the DC offset that the factory radio has. So we did adjust that in FIT2 and then fast forward to today, you know, of course we have to keep up with the times, we run into what's called FIT Plus. And the biggest difference on FIT Plus is it will accept up to a 40 volt input signal, which means typically about 400 watts of power. That is a huge amount of power that you can feed directly into a kicker amplifier. And when I say directly in, I'm talking about any factory system, any aftermarket system you have, if you want to connect a kicker amplifier to it, you do not need to buy an adjustable line output converter. In fact, we're going to tell you, please don't. You're going to be able to take those speaker leads that exist, tie directly into them, and go directly into the RCA input of our amplifier. And what that's going to give you now is you have a very, very, very high voltage signal that's running straight into your kicker amplifier. 
It's going to allow you to keep that gain control at or near minimum and still get full power out of your amplifier and be very clean, very quiet while it's doing it, which is what everyone wants. I don't think anyone out there is excited about putting in a brand new amplifier in their car, turning it on, and the first thing you hear is a lot of white noise or clicks or pops, or when you step on the brake pedal, you hear the brake lights come on, because those are realities that I've experienced in any car that's installed with the gains not set properly or not driving the proper signal back into the amplifier. Fit gets you around all of those issues. Now, Ernie, if you will, would you go to the next slide, please? And it's labeled Kissel. I'd love for you to do that for me. Ernie's back there in Hallelujah. Here we go. So now, this here, did you find a typo? Is there one? No. Speak up, Tim. No. Oh, I thought you said there was a typo. You, you said Hallelujah, and I said, Where's the title? <laughs> Boy, if that's not a Christmas vacation ref reference, I've never heard one. <laughs> that's awesome. Christmas is coming. So basically, what we're telling you is, and there's a lot of people calling to our tech services every day, and they're like, okay, I've got a kicker amplifier. I need to hook it into this factory radio. Tell me what adapter I need. This is the adapter we need. Now, I'm going to be straight up honest with you guys. The Kissel is nothing more than 16-gauge speaker wire that is then soldered to and connected to an RCA jack. And it makes it very easy for you to tie this into your factory system because now you do is you got speaker leads, you're gonna find the positive and negative that you need in the car, you're gonna strip back, you know, your preferred method of connection. I'm not here to judge anyone, whether it's solder and tape and heat shrink or a crimp cap, just don't do T taps, please, because I think everyone will just have a fit if you do that. But you can get the signal, you're literally taking that speaker lead signal, this converts it to an RCA plug, and you're gonna plug that straight into the kicker amplifier. If you are very technically inclined, you know how to use a soldering iron and you want to do it yourself, man, grab yourself some 16 gauge or some 18 gauge wire, solder to the center pin on the RCA for your hot, solder to the shield outside of your RCA for ground, get that put together, come out however far you need, whether it's two inches or 20 feet, and you can run that wire back and tie it into the factory radio signal. But here's the cool part, I keep saying factory because that's where a lot of people are end up having to tie their amplifiers in today. If you have a radio today, that has RCA outputs and it's a current gen radio. And you spend 100 bucks on it, 200 bucks on it, 300 bucks on it. We're fairly confident it doesn't have a true preamp out. You're not getting any benefit using that knockdown lower voltage RCA signal because now what you're doing is you're running a two volt or a three volt or maybe in a four volt if you're lucky signal back across the chassis of your car and you're trying to avoid noise and all those things. Wouldn't it be a whole lot nicer to run a 10 volt signal? or a 12 volt signal or a 16 volt signal because your amplifier, your kicker amp, it's gonna take that signal no matter what it is, set the gain properly up to 40 volts. So you're looking it'll work for anything from a volt up to 40 volts of input. You can take that signal directly into that amplifier and you're gonna get every bit of power the amplifier is designed to make and because you're running a stronger signal back, it's gonna do it quietly and it's gonna sound good doing it. And that's where the Kissel comes into play. We've had many, many, many cases including our own gear here. Uh, I'll use one for example, the PXIBT. I've had guys who have those and we talk about installation, they've got it all hooked up and I said, well, how'd you hook it up? And they said, oh yeah, we took RCAs out. And I said, get, you, get, a couple, get a couple Kissels and use the speaker leads of the PXI and use that to drive your RCA kit. Well, no, you can't, do, you can't use our, no, that's bad. Speaker leads sound bad. Don't do speaker, those are horrible. I've been told, man, my, my dad who knows audio said, never use speaker wires, only use RCA. And I go, yes. And I was one of those guys too, but you have to understand technology has changed and up to the point of clipping, that speaker lead output is just as clean, just as full bandwidth and everything it needs to be as that RCA signal. Why are you knocking the signal down to send it across the chassis just to bring that signal back up, which is what you do with an amplifier. And time after time, guys will swap out and all they'll do is they'll add a Kissel or if they're, if they're technical, they'll do make their own and they'll get that signal off the speaker leads and they're like, Holy smokes, I, I adjusted the gains. It sounds better. It actually sounds louder. It sounds cleaner. It sounds clearer. And at low volume, I don't hear all this extraneous noise. It's just amazing what it does switching over to those speaker leads. And of course, I have to smile and I have to eat a little bit of crow because I'm one of those guys that was trained back in the early 80s and up. And I remember the day where it was speaker leads suck. You've got to use RCAs and you kind of got to flip that mindset today and understand it's not the same today. The aftermarket radios you're interfacing into, as well as factory systems, have totally changed the game. And so this kind of goes back to the reason I set the story up to begin with. The reason Kicker doesn't do car head units is because we knew car head units were going to go away and the time was coming where you're going to have to use the radio that's in that car because it's too difficult 
too expensive, or at this point, literally some are impossible to remove. And this technology allows you to add anything you want to that factory radio and move on beyond that. You can do whatever you like. So Ernie, if you would, for me please, bring up the KISS Load 2 slide, if you don't mind. That should be the next asset that you've got on there. Now, we talked about this, and, uh, and I'm going to remind you about this again. We talked about this on last week's show, uh, the key lock. And when we talked about the key lock, we talked about all the different ways that factory radios are basically protecting themselves today. Uh, we're in a, what we like to call the third generation. They've kind of had three iterations of it, where the factory radio actually looks out there. It looks to see, is there a speaker connected? Is the speaker blown? Is the tweeter blown? Uh, any of those things before the radio will even pass signal. And I'm sure a lot of you guys who are, if you're DIY guys or you're a guy that works at a store and the first time you experienced one, you know, you get in, you tie into the speaker leads, whether you, most of you guys are using line output converters or Kissels, you get it all set up and you go to the amplifier and there's no audio. And it's because that radio is going, um, I'm a protection circuit and I don't see speakers hooked up so I'm not going to pass a signal. So that technology has kept evolving. We kind of kept track with it with uh, Fit and Fit2. And those technologies actually brought along for a ride what's called a loading resistor. So it would actually fool the factory radio into thinking it was still connected to speakers and it would pass a signal. But what's happened with Gen 3, and that's why if you look, if we go back to that slide, we won't, but if we did go back to the slide, you can actually rewind the video and watch it later. But Fit Plus, which is the new technology, we don't have loading resistors there anymore because what's happened is the loading resistor you need to fool the radio today has gotten so big and it passes uh, enough heat, it creates enough heat as the signals pass through it, that it's really not uh, convenient, nor is it safe to just throw inside a small box uh, by itself. Uh, I've seen pictures online, I've had installers I've dealt with send me pictures on that where guys who have to deal with factory radios do this, they'll literally just take a big sandstone resistor, and I know you guys have seen them before, it's a little, like looks like a, a, a creamy white uh, big a resistor, the center is ceramic, it's a resistor, and it's designed to provide a load and the way it does that is everything has to get shed in heat. And I've seen cars that literally probably uh, were this close to burning to the ground because they just hang those resistors off the back of the radio. That is not safe. You do not want to do that, and we will never recommend it here at Kicker. But what we do know is you, there are a whole bunch of radios out there that you have to load in order for them to pass a signal, and we need a safe way for you to load them. And that's what the KISS Load 2. And if Ernie, if you'll go to the next one, the KISS Load 2 is 400 watts, so it allows you to put up to 400 watts of input on two separate channels. Ernie, if you'll go to the next one, the KISS Load 4, thank you, sir. This one here is the KISS Load 4, and it will do uh, basically the same thing, but it's 100 watts times four, so four channels. So between these two devices, and they look like little mini amplifiers is really what they look like. As a matter of fact, if Tim, if he wants to zoom in on one of these, he can at his leisure. I'll just point to him down here on the table. But the KISS Load 4 and the KISS Load 2, they allow you to safely mount these under a seat, behind a glove box where there's some air circulation, uh, in a center console where there may be enough room for air to circulate. But the resistors that are loaded into these boxes are going to create quite a bit of heat. And this is actually a heat sink built around those loading resistors so that you can safely fool the factory radio you're tying into to tell it, hey, I'm hooked to a load, I'm hooked to speakers, I can safely play a signal. And this is how we approach that game. Now the cool part about this is, if you're not going to put an amplifier into a car that needs a uh, loading resistor, there's no need for you to buy it and there's no need to add it. That's why this is not built into the amplifiers. We did build it in up to fit two, and when it got to the point that it needed such large resistors and the cost for them, we decided it was smart to just pull those out make it a separate add-on piece, and if you're buying an amplifier that you don't need that type of interface technology, you're not paying for it. But if you do have a car that you need that technology, get yourself a KISS load, throw it into the system, and you're good to go. You can now safely get a signal out of that radio and pass it on to your amplifier. And these KISS loads, they are not going to affect your signal. The signal going into this, if it's full bandwidth 20 to 20, whatever it is, the output of it is the same full bandwidth 20 to 20. These do not impact or alter the signal. They simply provide the loading so that the radio will stay on and pass the signal on out the system. And as you can see, this is another building block in how Kicker goes to market and how we do factory integration. And as you can see, all these things I'm showing you are how we address some of those key things we talked about that are important to getting great interface great sound and minimal noise in your car. Now Ernie, if you'll move on along, I would like to move to the KISS lock. That would be the next slide. Thank you, sir. Now, I don't want to just poo-poo 
so to speak, over all line output converters. There are people that need them. If you have an amplifier that does not have differential input technology, like kicker amps do, and you want to interface that into a factory system or an aftermarket radio using speaker leads, you are going to have to use some kind of a line output converter. Now the KISS lock that you see up on the uh, on your screen here right now, this is the KISS lock. We do make a KISS lock too, and I'll get to that in a second. But the KISS lock, do you want to zoom in on one? Here, let me bring one up for you here. I'll actually make it convenient for you. Right there. Does that help? Okay, Timmy's going to get you a little close up on that so you can get a look at that. But this is the KISS lock. And as you can see, I mean, I'm going to go back down. This thing's tiny. I mean, this thing is, is very, very tiny. It's extremely small. Very compact. It's easy to put behind the dash. It's easy to put in the center console. It's easy to come off the rear deck of speaker leads. Whatever you're going to get into, this KISS lock is very, very small. It's very convenient. It's very easy to use. And this one is adjustable. There are potentiometer or pots on top, so you can adjust how much signal you're going to get out of the KISS lock. But this KISS lock, will, it'll take up to as much as 55 watts of input, and it will give you up to 8 volts of output. And it's sonically neutral. And we're going to drive that point home really hard here in just a second by what we mean on sonically neutral. Now, in a line output converter, the quality of what you're going to hear is based on what the circuitry in that line output converter does. And it can alter the signal. There is an inductor in there, or a transformer, and its job is to couple the balanced speaker leads and turn it into an unbalanced RCA output. And so that transformer has to be there to accept that signal, move it on down the highway, but make sure that it doesn't short those speaker leads that are on that factory radio, or else you're gonna blow up your factory radio. You don't wanna do that. So that's what the KISS lock does, but it does it, and it does it in a sonically neutral way. And so with that said, Ernie, if you will, bring up the KISS lock too on the next slide. I appreciate it, sir, thank you very much. Now, he's actually, and I'm glad he's actually going to join us. He was actually doing another training for some dealers. Come on, Ken. Come on and join us. Take, take a side wherever you want. Right. Pick one. Pick another. Uh, ladies and gentlemen. I don't want to be in front of your laptop. You've got a pretty not, big no, setup you're, here. You're good. You're good. What's up, so, everyone? Hey, Ernie, yeah, come out to camera uh, two for me real quick, if you don't mind. Which one's camera there two? There you go. Come. There you go. Or no, next one. Get, get Ken in the pit. There. That's Oh, there I am. Hey, what's up, everyone? <laughs> so, Ken. Thanks for joining us, man. Yeah, man, for you sure. Know, uh, in reality, this is serious. Ken was just doing a training with some of our dealers. He yep. Every other Tuesday, you do some trainings online. For every other Tuesday, we have a particular distributor that we do trainings with. Um, it's kind of a standing appointment. So every Tuesday night, I happen to be in the building doing a training tonight, and uh, thought I'd poke my head in. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to pick on him because I can do this. Cause I actually like Ken. I mean, the, the more time I've got to spend with him, he is really an articulate yeah. guy. He knows his product, and he's really good at getting the point home and talking about it. Do you and usually I'm, have people here you don't like? Sometimes. Is that what you're saying? Well, oh, okay. I'm here. I don't like me most days. I think John so was here that. last week, so what are you saying? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, Ken really does know his stuff, and so when we found out he was available, I said, Ken, whenever you get free, just come down and join us. I'd love, love to have you on the show. Yeah, appreciate and it. So thanks for joining us. We, that is, now that you pointed out, that's the demo we're going to go to next. Okay. Um, and you actually kind of helped me along on this to set it up. Maybe okay. Well, what, well, I just got here, so you got to tell me what, well, what we're doing. Let's let's do this, Ernie. If you will, go back and bring up the Kiss Lock Two screen. Yeah, I heard you talking about the Kiss Locks, but I've missed everything before that. Well, let's do this. Since you're here, leave that up, Ernie. Leave the Kiss Lock Two up on the screen. But you obviously heard what was going on. Do you have anything to add for the Kiss Lock? I mean, you heard what I had to say. So the the original Kiss Lock, the Kiss Lock One, so to speak. Um, I think you nailed it all. I mean, it's a, a a great sounding line output converter, and that's one of the things that we like to tout. Um, not only does it do its job of converting from high level or speaker level signal down to a low level or RCA level signal, um, it does it a, at a uh, extremely high fidelity. Um, so it sounds great uh, compared to some other LOCs that are at that price point. So what I'm going to do, and you know, you, can, you are perfect timing here. If you would, I'm actually going to move the HDMI cable to this laptop so we can do okay. the demo. But while I'm doing that, tell everyone what the difference between a KISS lock and the KISS Lock 2 is. Sure, so the KISS Lock 2 is the newer, better brother of the KISS Lock 1. Which camera am I looking at? This guy right here, I guess. Yeah, I want the red light on yeah, where okay. you're at. So you can see that it's just a little tiny bit larger than the KISS Lock 1, but still extremely small. You should have no problems hiding this behind a, a, you know, a head unit or a glove box or in a door pan or a um, you know, quarter panel or whatever it might be. But the biggest improvement to the KISS Lock 2 is this blue wire right here. 
And you may be thinking, oh, that's probably a, an amp turn on. And you're right, it is in, in fact an amp turn on. So this is able to give you a 12 volt remote turn on for your amplifier, but it does this with no 12 volt input of any kind. So there's plenty of LOCs out there that will give you a 12 volt remote, remote turn on out, but they all require 12 volt constant as an input. This is really first of its kind. So if you hook up these speaker wires directly to that factory head unit or whatever you, you source you're using, and then it has a black wire you're gonna ground. So you can ground that black wire directly to chassis wherever the LOC is mounted, and now you're gonna get 12 volts out up to, I believe it's 100 milliamp current. And just as a heads up, 100 milliamp, 100 milliamp is uh, enough to turn on about 50 kicker amplifiers with that, and you know uh, probably a dozen of many other manufacturers amplifiers. So that's plenty of current. You could trip a relay with it and turn on whatever you wanted, LEDs or whatever you want to do with it, really. Um, so it's it's plenty powerful enough to turn on your amplifiers, but with no 12 volt input of any kind required. Truly remarkable. You know, I, I thank you, and I knew you'd know a lot about that. And that's what I really want to drive the point home, so to speak, is what he's telling you is. This device ties right into the factory speaker leads, you ground it, and then it gives you a remote out. It's actually creating a 12 volt turn on because it is buffering and amplifying the DC offset that it's seeing coming down the speaker. Exactly, lead. so I don't know if he's already talked about DC offset tonight. A Little bit, um, but go ahead. So there is a small amount, along with your AC music signal, there's generally a small amount of DC voltage that rides along with it. Um, so all of kicker amplifiers are able to see that DC voltage and turn on and off without having a 12 volt input. But if you're using an LOC, uh, maybe a competitor amplifier, God forbid, you need that 12 volt turn on, um, this is able to harness that DC offset and then turn that into uh, 12 volts that you can then turn on an amplifier with. So a little bit of black magic, so to speak, but it very is powerful a, piece. It is a little bit of black magic and let's, I mean, and I know because I've heard people doing this, you know, in a lot of modern cars today, everything is on the bus, meaning it's on the computer bus. So right. your factory radio in that car, it's probably got a constant power and a ground, but everything that happens in that radio is controlled via computer or data bus signals. Right. So anyone looking for a, a typical remote turn on, so my key's on or my radio's on, I want a turn on, it's not there to get because it not doesn't behind the exist. Head unit. Not behind the head unit. No. But I know of cases where people will buy this KISS Lock 2 and interface it into their factory radio just so they can get a remote turn on for other things that aren't even audio related. Like I said, LEDs or... Um you know, that's that's probably the most common one I see, non-audio related, right? Like LED strips of some kind, or or not, because if you got fit, you don't need any of this, right? Fit that's built into our amplifier input stage, for like I was saying. So fit input can do DC offset on and off, and it can take speaker level directly into the RCA inputs of the amplifier. So uh, this is really for everybody else's amplifiers, exactly. <laughs> and we make one, but here's the thing, and and if you don't mind, I'm going to switch sides with you. No, you no, come no. down here, no and I'm going to come down here, and and we apologize. We have to turn on and. It, hopefully it won't make any noise, but it's a power supply so we can run all this. And it's a little demo. And if you were here for the key lock demo, you might have heard some of the power supply noise then. But we're going to fire this up. And what we've got going on right here, and this is not to disparage any brand, so we're not going to tell you what brand it is. If you know what brand it is, you can, you can talk about it amongst yourselves if you choose. But we're not here to pick on any brand. We're here to pick on technology and show you what you can and can't get based on different technologies. So this demo we've got set up here, we have a radio, an aftermarket radio. We're coming out the speaker leads, and we're coming into two line output converters that are right here on the table. And you can see this is the KISS Lock 2. And this one is another one that I, I guess we could An say. An unnamed could, brand, a popular brand B uh, bought from a big box, big box store. There you go. I like that analogy right there. So basically, what we've got going on is we're going to be playing pink noise. And if you hadn't watched last week's show, or if you aren't familiar with it, pink noise is basically equal energy at all octaves. So when we look at how the human ear listens and what we look for, it's called a 31 band EQ or 31 octave EQ. And so pink noise is basically the same energy at all those different bands. It's not, it's not, it's not a single frequency, it's a group of frequencies. And so if you look at pink noise, it should be a perfectly flat line or pretty close. It's never gonna be perfectly flat because of the variations and things. So you'll get a little dancing line, but it should be relatively flat. More or less, yeah. It, you shouldn't see big peaks and you shouldn't be see big valleys or roll-offs on either end right. if whatever component you're testing, if you feed pink noise into it and then you measure it and look at it, you should see this consistently flat line that's dancing up and down a little bit without big peaks and without big valleys. Right. So what we're going to do, Ernie, if you will, would you bring up the input to the laptop for me, sir, so we can get that up on the screen? Thank you very much. 
So I'm going to go to the deck here, and I'm going to get us started. I'll have to get out of standby again because we turned everything off. So I'm going to get from radio. I don't know if they're seeing you, Kip. They probably aren't, and it's okay if they're not seeing me. Oh, there, I'm down a little picture in picture. So I'm bringing up the USB thumb drive, and I've got pink noise on here. So 20-minute pink noise is playing. I don't know if they can see your laptop. Oh, yeah, they're not seeing the laptop. Ernie, is that the laptop feed you got up? Okay, let me see here. For some reason, it's not up. Let me, I may have to do a little discombobulation. Let me unplug and plug back in. Maybe it just I needs... I have to go ghetto style and just flip your, <laughs> flip your laptop around for There them. we go. Ah, all right, perfect. Nice. Okay, so we are looking... I want to show you guys here what's going on, so hopefully you can see. So up here at the top, I got left input and I've got right input. And this little... These two A-locks are down here. We have the kicker coming in on the right channel. So kicker's red. Kicker's red. And we have the competitive product coming in on the left channel. And when I switch to it, it will be blue. So as you can see, if you, Ernie, if you want to go back to that shot, that's a good shot. Thank you. So basically, the signal coming out of the radio, we have one speaker lead going into the kicker, kiss lock two. And then it's going into the right channel of the computer, which is measuring it on the RTA. And then we have the left channel coming into this other lock. We're coming out of this into the left channel. And we're coming into the RTA. So now if you'll go back, Ernie, there you go. Thank you, sir. What you're watching right now, this is the right channel coming through the kicker lock two, the kiss lock two, and you're seeing it on our RTA. And as we kind of described what you would see, that looks pretty typical for what you look at for a pink noise, don't you think? Yeah, Ken? absolutely. More or less, um, you know, extremely flat. Like you, you said, there's usually dancing in the signal, but you're not looking at eight or ten decibels of difference between frequencies. Exactly. This is a pretty common looking thing right there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going up here at the top, and all I'm going to do is change the input to the RTA from the right channel, I'm now going to go to the left channel. And it'll take it a couple seconds to stabilize because it has, it's averaging the signal, look at everything. So when I click the button, give it a few seconds, it'll stabilize. But I want you to watch what's happening. And all I'm doing is I'm looking at the output now from the competitive adjustable line output converter. So here we go. So as you can see, all of you out there watching, I hope you can see what's going on right there. What just happened to the bass? It's rolling off hard. And so that's, that's typical for inexpensive lineup converters of that design. Correct. So all of you people out there who are into car audio, and if you're into car audio, I know you're into good, solid bass performance because good, solid bass is the fundamental part of building. A, it's, the, it's the core building block. It's what we do. It's what we do. <laughs> it's what we love. I mean, if you're in the kicker parking lot when it's opening time, you know the people who like bass. Sure. They're all coming For to sure. work. But as you can see, this is what's going to happen out of, uh, and, and we're, not, we're not picking on just this one. There are many, many, many adjustable line output converters on the market that will exhibit this type of roll off on the bottom end, and some of them even go the opposite direction. They'll even roll off the top end as well. Right, exactly. They start narrowing the bandwidth that's passed through, that it allows to pass through. And so what that boils down to is basically the uh, transformer that's inside and the componentry they use to get this signal is actually acting like, in this case, it is a high pass filter, and it is rolling off, and it's a very pretty roll off, as you can see there right. in the blue, it's basically taking out all the low frequencies out of your music. So you buy a subwoofer amp, you buy a big subwoofer, you put it in your car, you have to use a line output converter to hook to your factory radio, so you pick up whatever might be available, and this is what you're feeding your subwoofer amplifier. You basically bought a filter to take bass away, which is what you really want to do was add bass to your right. car. And the signal you're putting in is no longer flat. So even your bass signal, so 80 hertz, is not the same relative to 40 hertz. You get a very uneven response. Exactly. Music doesn't sound like music. Uh, certain frequencies or tones are going to sound quieter than other frequencies and right. tones. And just to give you an example, I'm just going to go back to the right input. And so all we're doing is we're telling the RTA here to look at the kicker, uh, kiss lock two now, instead of the blue one. And I want you to look at what happens to that frequency response. Watch what's going on. And as you can see, switching over to the kicker, we're back to that fairly consistent, great little dancing flat line, and the low end, the bass, is not being rolled off. Exactly. As I said, extremely sonically neutral, a good high fidelity LOC. And at that price point, you don't often get that. And you brought that up, and of course I'm going to show my ignorance here. Do you know what the price point on that is? Uh, retail on it, I don't. I want to say 30 bucks. Okay. Full retail. So it's around 29 Please don't bucks. hold me to that, but it's very close. I'll say that that's very close. And, and again, for those, hopefully everyone's got to look at this. So this is, we're looking at the kicker kiss lock two right now. That's the red graph on the RTA. I'm going to switch back to the left input, which will be the competitive product. 
and I want you to see what happens to the base. And like I said, it takes a few moments for it to stabilize out because the RTA is averaging to look at everything. And look at how drastic of a roll off is happening yep. in the low frequency. And so, again, I hope all of you understand this exercise is not to pick on any particular product. We're picking on a technology exactly. and we're showing you that it's important that you get a high quality line output converter so that you're getting everything that's available in your radio from 20 to 20. That's what we all joke about. It's yep. the 20 lowest. hertz to 20K. Yeah, exactly. 20 hertz, which is your lowest, your more of a feel it base, and then up at 20K, that's your sparkle and your high end. And these line output converters can, as you can see from the kicker, it doesn't have to, but these line output converters can affect the signal you're getting out of your radio. And nobody here, I am sure, wants to invest however much money into an amp and then into a subwoofer and then have to use a line output converter that is now taking away the base that you're trying to get back into your ride. Right. So I hope that little demonstration there was fun. I hope that you got something out of it and it helps you understand why Kicker is so focused on the tools that we have at our disposal. We really want to be able to interface into whatever environment it is, whether it's a factory system where you are, I use the word stuck, but in a lot of cases it's not necessarily a bad stuck because it's steering wheel controls, it's Bluetooth. It could be a 10 inch touch screen with navigation the whole nine yards, so a lot of people say, why pull it out and put in a eight inch third party manufacturer? Yeah. Why would you do it? I mean, understood. And, and a lot of cases, everything right from the factory. Android so, Auto, CarPlay, the yep. whole nine yards. So, so we, we designed it to, uh, you know, a lot of pieces for our amplifiers to integrate with those factory systems. Exactly. So that's really Kicker's integration philosophy is we want you to be able to integrate into the systems that you, you can't easily upgrade the factory radio, you really have all the features you want, but what doesn't sound good is it has no bass, or there's not enough power on the mids and highs, or I don't like the mids and highs. Whatever it might be, you know, whatever your, your personal tastes are, um, you can then adapt our stuff to your particular car, whether that's you know, a Honda Civic or that's a Land Rover. Exactly, whatever it is out there you can interface to. And the point I want to drive home is, if you're using a kicker amplifier that has fit technology in it, you, you don't need a line output converter. There's, there's very, 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 very few rare cases where a tech at Kicker might say, well, we need you to put a KISS lock or KISS lock 2 into that system. They're very rare. Most of the time, what we're going to tell you is pick up a Kissel, or if you're mechanically or electrically uh, uh, you know, good with your hands, savvy. Yeah. you can make your own because it's literally just the center pin of the RCA is going to the positive speaker wire and the outer part, the ground shield of the RCA is going to the negative speaker lead and we are taking speaker leads directly into that kicker amplifier. And like the picture we showed earlier where it was a separate high level input, which basically just means there's a line output converter built into the amplifier. Right. You're, not, you're not magically taking speaker leads into a high level input and getting better sound quality or better signal noise. You're just going through a built in line output converter. Exactly. Our amplifiers with FIT are literally taking that signal straight into the differential RCA input and using that signal lets you turn that gain down on the amplifier, still get every bit of power you paid for and have a great noise floor and a better musical experience. Exactly. Do you have anything to add to that, Ken? I mean, uh, No, other than just the voltages themselves. So on the IQ amplifiers, as well as the KXA line of amplifiers, the black and red amplifiers, that's going to be 10 volts in directly into those RCA inputs. On our CXA line of amplifiers, uh, the newest version of CXA, it's going to be, or it is currently 40 volts. So there's no OEM signal out there, even a factory amplified subwoofer channel. Put some RCAs on it, shove it right into a CXA amplifier, you're good to go. So if you've got, even if it's a high-end Harman Kardon system or whatever it might be, it doesn't matter. We're talking 40 volts or 400 watts, on, that's per channel. So if you have more than 400 RMS out of a factory subwoofer channel, there's none out there to do that just yet. So, no, there, yeah. and, and when they do, when we have to cross that bridge, Kicker will come up with whatever we need to be able to give you the tools Absolutely. to cross that bridge. And that's yeah. why it started off with Fit, and then Fit 2, and then Fit Plus. That's exactly. That's why it's evolved over time, of course, because those factory systems have evolved over time. It, it's not a game of checkers. It's a game of chess. That's right. <laughs> and so when there's a new piece put on the playing field that we have to find a way to get around, trust me, we're going to figure out how to get around it and give you the best way to interface a Kicker amplifier into whether it's an OE system or even, <laughs> like I tell you guys, forget using the RCA speaker leads on your head unit. Take those speaker leads, run into a Kissel, go straight back to a kicker amplifier. It's going to sound better. Yep. 
I know it sounds crazy, but time and time again, it's not just about removing that noise floor. It's you're getting a better signal to that amp. You're, get, you're still getting full power, but you're getting it without having to amplify it as much, and it sounds a whole lot better. Exactly. Less gain needed. Stronger signal in, less gain needed. Absolutely. So with that said, um, hey, Jeremy, have you found any questions? There was one I saw. If you want to find a couple more, I'd like to try to get some questions up here. Someone actually asked the question, and I saw it, and I think it was his name was Chris. You don't have to go find it. Just find another one. But Chris asked, he says, I've, uh, I think it was, I got a key 180.4. Is there any reason for me to upgrade to a key 200.4? And I guess, I guess the answer to that would be, it's an incremental upgrade. I mean, the best way I could probably put it into perspective is, you know, like cell phone companies, it seems to be like what's called a tick-tock cycle. You know, a tick is just a small upgrade, and then a tock is a major exactly. upgrade. So this is more of the tick. This is more the tick upgrade on a 180 versus a 200. Yes, it does have a little more power. Yes, there has been some changes inside, and it does have a, a little better codec. It's got a little better signal-noise ratio. There are incremental improvements in a 200.4 over a 180.4. I would never want to imply that you're going to see magical differences between the two. Yeah, I mean, if if you got it for free, then sure. <laughs> but if uh, you know, regardless of how much money you make, I would say that it's you probably hang on to what you got. You know, if, uh, a good unbiased opinion. If you guys wanted to go look, and you know, and that would answer your question, Chris. Do I upgrade from a 180 to a 200.4? is uh, Dean and Fernando, who obviously run Five Star, and if you guys are watching this channel, I know you know who they are. Yeah, they did a video on it. They actually did a video on that where they actually pulled out the 180.4, and it was really easy because it's the same harness. It is, the exact same <laughs> connection, so it's generally no work. You gotta run the auto setup program, obviously have all those results saved into the new 200.4, uh, but that, like you said, they do have a video that compares the 184 to the 204 um, and their thoughts on it, so. So if you wanna go check that out, go check them out and get that information straight from their viewpoint. Right, third they, party. They felt it was a good upgrade, and they tell you why. So go check that out, Chris, and that'll help you know, maybe solidify or help push you one way or the other on what you need to do. We got Brian here. Brian says, 800.1 with factory head unit, what's the best active LOC kicker has? Well, that I'm going to answer that question. I'm going to answer this one, then you can chime in. Sure, sure. Time. The best LOC the kicker has, if you're just saying LOC in the conventional term, would be the Kiss Lock 2. But I'm going to back up, and I'm going to step all over what I just told you. The best LOC kicker makes is this one right here, and I'm going to pull it into the picture so my buddy Tim can get a close-up sh close shot of it. And this is the key lock. And if you're talking about interfacing into a factory radio, the reason I'm pushing you to and talking about the key lock is first off, it's only 99 bucks. It's 100 bucks retail for a key lock. But what the key lock does, and I don't want to get too far into it because this is episode six, so if you go back into our YouTube feed and go to episode five, that's last Tuesday's feed, we went in deep on the key lock and showed you why, if you're interfacing to any factory radio today, the obstacles that are there and what the key lock will overcome. If you are wanting to get the best signal out of that factory radio, accomplish that task, fix any of the peaks or roll-offs that are there, the auto base roll-off, the EQ that they've put in the factory. If you want to get all that out and get back to a flat full range base signal and then feed it to your amplifier, this is the line output converter you want to use, and that right. is the key lock. And that's not just for base signal. No. Just that, that's going to be full range, 20 hertz, all the way up to 20 kilohertz, the key lock will work for. So any other, Jeremy, if you got any other questions, throw them up on the screen. I think he also mentioned, he said with the 800.1 amplifier, so let me stress again, uh, I don't know if you have the CXA or the KXA 800.1, um, but we can. you don't need an LOC with the kicker amplifier. So if it's a CXA 800.1, whatever that factory head unit or amplifier outputs, put some RCA ends on the end of that wire and run it to the amp. You don't need any LOC. If it's the KXA and it happens to be a factory amplified signal, um, then you can step it down with the key lock, for example, uh, and that would work great. So we got Marshall Johnson here, he's asking, is the Kissel compatible with an OE system that already has a Bose amplifier running the factory speakers? And I know the answer, tell him, Ken. So the Kissel is nothing more than RCA and speaker wire. There's no electronics built into it or anything, it's just an RCA pin and barrel with speaker wire soldered onto those. Um, so it's, it's never gonna be not compatible with anything, it's just it doesn't change the signal at all. Um, so in your particular question, is it compatible with you know, that Bose amplifier? Sure, you can solder that into those speaker leads um, and now you can have the RCA end of that run directly into most kicker amplifiers. Again, depends how much voltage you have on that factory signal. Oh, yeah, here we go. So it's gonna come just the base set up here. Am I, let Tim get a little shot or should I just put it back on the table? No, go ahead, he can, he can zoom in on you there. Okay. Go ahead and let Tim so me. all it is is RCA tips, 
obviously male tips that plug into an amplifier and just bare speaker wire in the other end. So if you want to solder these into or tape them into um, your factory Bose speaker, uh, of course it's compatible. It does come with some female to female connectors if you needed to lengthen this. Say, say for example, your uh, Bose amplifier was you know, behind the glove box or something and you had your amp back in the back of the car. So you could then run uh, regular RCAs from that. But there's no electronics built into this. Hey, kick, Jeremy, get that one. Down, no, no, up, right. Come down. Whoa, you missed it. Up one more. Go up. Right there. Hit it. No, come on down. Right there. Boom. Kicking right. it with Kip. All right, I, I, got, I had to have you call this that one out. brother? That's my brother watching from uh, Spencerville, Ohio, right there. What's up, Kevin? Spencerville, Ohio is in the house right there, brother. <laughs> hey, thanks for the shout-out, Kevin. I appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in and watching. If I knew you were watching, I'd have been nervous. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, uh, Jeremy, while you're there looking, try to find another question or two that would be a good question. But what I'm going to do here... It's that time, you know, we talked a lot about products, we kind of run over this. I was going to do a couple of these during the show, but this right here is the Kicker Unmasked Live t-shirt. Now, when we did the original show, that was actually a limited edition. They were actually black and white, and to keep those limited edition, for everyone we told, we actually came out with a new one. This is kind of a, a heather gray. Yeah. It's got the Unmasked Live on it, and it's got the Live in red, which is really the logo that you guys see. I think we should give some of these away. What do you think, Ken? Absolutely. So here's what we're going to do. You're going to think of a question. Okay. I'm going to put you on the spot. Something about the products that are on this table we've talked go about over, tonight. I've got a question about something that I've recently said, so if you're paying attention. Perfect. So what we're going to do is the first two people to chime in, and we see you in the StreamYard feed, and this is going to be Bill. We'll try to watch here, but Bill's the guy that actually takes care of this for us. The first chime in from a Facebook and the first chime in from a YouTube, so we're going to take both. They come into the StreamYard feed are going to be the winners. And if you are the winners, Bill, who's in our social feed or in the comment boxes there, he will give you it's social at kicker.com. He'll ask you to email there with your information, and we're going to send you out a Kicker Unmasked Live t-shirt in your size. So with that said, Extra Ken, small only. X, XS only. Medium. <laughs> medium around the horn for everybody. That's right. So uh, orange whip? Orange whip? Three orange whips around the horn. It's another old movie reference. Yeah, he started probably. me on it earlier today. If oh, anyone okay. gets that movie reference, I should probably give you a T-shirt. So what's your question, Ken? So earlier we talked about the uh, amount of signal voltage that our kicker amplifiers can accept. So what is the signal voltage that can run into a CXA, the newest CXA line of amplifiers? What is the maximum amount of signal voltage that can be uh, run into the new CXA amplifiers? Okay, I'm RDC. seeing Brandon Wallace from YouTube at 40. He's I got, yep, he's that, the first one I see. He's the first one I oh, see. Oh, man, they're flying up. I can't keep up with them. All right, so wait, and we got, whoa, wait. We'll leave that up to Bill. Yeah, Bill. There's a few of them in there. Bill, you're going to have to figure that out. They're the all coming The correct answer in. is 40, as, as uh, Kip just said. The correct answer is 40. So 40 volts, 40 volts uh, directly into the RCA inputs of any kicker CXA amplifier, the new line of CXAs. You know, and it's crazy, you know, we talk, talk voltages and, and things like that, but really, 40 volts equates out to into a 4-ohm speaker load. That's 400 watts of yeah, power. Yeah, that's per channel, not for the entire amplifier. So 400 watts on any one channel of signal signal in, into the amplifier. So it's already awfully strong, and now you're going to amplify it. I know it sounds crazy, but, you know, people are having to add amplifiers, and sometimes it's not just about getting more power. Sometimes they want to add processing or anything exactly. like that, and then they need to get into a new amplifier to get that to come out. So we've got to be able to interface into those higher voltages so right. you can get into those bigger power yeah. amplifiers. Maybe the factory came with one 10-inch subwoofer, and you want two 15s. So that factory 10 inch subwoofer has, let's say, 200 watts RMS on it. Solder on some RCAs, run it right into a CXA 1801 or whatever it might be, and uh, you know you'll be banging. Absolutely. So with that said, you know, kind of goes back to, and I didn't have Ernie bring it up because it's actually a close up. If you're interested in the key lock. Guys, go back. It's last week's episode. It'll be on the Kicker YouTube channel. It's episode five of Kicker Unmasked Live. And we really did dive deep, and we did a lot of things with the RTA right here to show you what the key lock corrects. If you're dealing with a factory system and you want to correct either the base roll-off, all-pass or all-phase filtering that could be in there, the equalization the factory's put on board, if you want to take time care correction. of any of time correction, if you want to take care of any of those problems and start with a clean, flat, ready-to-go signal that now you feed into your amp or your DSP or whatever you want to do after that to do your acoustic tuning, exactly. you're always going to be better off starting with an absolute flat signal, and that's what the key lock is going to give you. Now, if you have one of those factory systems that you're not going to have to deal with some of those things, if it's back a few years and you're not dealing with a lot 
of those issues, absolutely use the fit inputs. Uh, if you don't have a kicker amp, use the Kiss Lock or the Kiss Lock 2, and you're going to get that full bandwidth. That's why we wanted to show you the Kiss Lock 2 tonight with the RTA, is that it does matter what adjustable line output converter you're using because it will affect your frequency response. They're not all the same. They're not all the same. And we can tell you that all day long. Ken can go out in the field and tell dealers that all day long. But when you finally, when the rubber hits the road, as I yep. like to speak, and you can see it on a computer with test information, you know what we're telling you is the way it is. And we truly want you to get the best performance out of whatever gear you're putting in your car because car audio is fun. It's a great experience. And when you have an enjoyable experience, exactly. you're going to get a lot more entertainment out of that ride. Exactly. Now, with that said, I keep waiting for Jeremy to find a question or two, and they're flying up. I haven't seen any. So I'm, you know what? We've got just a few minutes here before we hit. I, I call it a hard stop. I'd like to start at 90 minutes. Okay. Let's give away a couple more T-shirts. Do you think a couple of you out there would like to win a T-shirt? Uh, probably. It looked like we had quite a few responses for the first one. So All right, let's do this again. Let's do this again. Let's, let's do another two T-shirts. Same rules apply. Bill, our social guy, he's following the StreamYard feed. He will find and flag the first response from Facebook, the first response from YouTube. Those two people will be the winners, and you're going to get yourself a Kicker Unmasked Live t-shirt. I hate to put you on the spot, Kim, but I'm going to do it again. It Alrighty. Is, hit me with another question. Okay, we talked a little bit about the Kiss Lock 2, and we said that it can give you that 12-volt remote turn-on output to turn your amplifiers on and off. Um, how does it do that? Okay, how does the Kiss Lock 2... What, what does it use to get that voltage? Where does it come from? Where does, how does the Kiss Lock, or what does it use... Kiss to Lock get, 2. Kiss Lock 2. How does it create that turn-on voltage? That's a good question. We'll see if anyone can get the answer out there. I see a lot of tens. <laughs> oh, there's a few of them there. Oh, 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 oh there it is. Jordan? They were trying to jump the gun. And they, they were, were. 10 volts, 10 volts, 10 <laughs> they volts. Were, they there's were. a bunch of them. Uh, there's a bunch of people in there that got the correct answer. So we'll have Bill sort that out and yeah. uh, get that out to the winners. Hey, I don't know if you're the winner, but it looks like you might be, Jordan. We'll let, uh, we'll let uh, Bill, our social guy, figure that out. But I did see the answer. And the correct answer to that is DC offset. Right. And like Ken was explaining on that, there is a 5, 6 volt DC offset signal that rides along on that factory audio yep, signal. It depends on the vehicle. It's generally half a battery voltage, but we've seen quarter battery voltage on some vehicles, um, but it can it can take that. I believe it's as low as two and a half volts of DC offset. It'll boost it all the way up to 12 volts at 100 milliamp. And what's interesting, I'm glad you brought that up. For you guys out there are, te are techie, you know, we actually, when we went to Fit 2 and eventually on to Fit Plus, that was another one of the things that we had to do in that chess game of interfacing with factory radios is we found out that people were calling going, hey, the DC offset's not working anymore. Exactly. And so we actually had to figure Good out call. why. That's exactly right. And so we came back to the table with Fit Plus, and that handles and addresses all those issues. So understand, we have, I mean, all joking aside, R&D 35? Staff members? Yeah. Oh, I have no idea. It's a good chunk of people. A whole floor of our building. Yeah, a whole floor of our building is dedicated to research and design, guys. We're not just a company that puts a name on a product. We design and develop it all here in-house. And when we get feedback from the field through consumers like you, or if you're a dealer or you're an installer watching, you're the same people we take that feedback from. That helps us develop products to handle and fix the problems. Right. You, we're, we're the solution company. Right. At the end of the day, if we can't fix your problem, you can't experience great audio, and that's what we're here is we're creating solutions to fix exactly. those problems. So that said, I want to do one more round of T-shirts. I, okay. I just feel it. Do you feel right. it? Yeah, I, I feel, feel it. it. I feel it. What else? What, right. what can I ask? So what we're going to do, we're going to do I wasn't here for the first half. I don't know what else you <laughs> covered. Yeah. Here, here's, you can go off the reservation on this question. You can ask any kicker-related or audio well, question Let's make it something, something that's integration, maybe something that we have here on the table. Yeah, you can pick from anything you got here and come up with something, Ken. Okay, okay, okay. Are you ready? Um, so, so same rules apply, guys and gals. First two responses, the first one from Facebook and the first one from YouTube, you're going to be the winners. Bill, our social guy, is watching the feed, so he's the referee. Don't beat him up too hard, but he's the one who's going to determine the winners on this, and it's going to be another set of these Kicker Unmasked Live t-shirts. Ken, what's the question? All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about the KISS loads. I don't know if you talked about those at all tonight. We did. We all did. Right, so on the two-channel version of the KISS load, what is the maximum amount of wattage that it can handle? Ooh, that's a good question. So on the KISS load two channel. Correct. What's the maximum wattage that that thing is designed to? Uh, of course, 10. He's always going to say 10. I think Kevin just, that's Kevin Litzy, Spencer, Spencer Tucky, Ohio, right there. 10's his answer. Kevin, that's not you're the wrong. Answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just saw it. 
Eduardo Salvador. There's yep, there. there's a few. I think Eduardo might have been the first one I saw. Oh, there's but, a bunch. They're yeah, there's a bunch. Quick. They're all climbing in. I see Dean there at 400. 400 Dean. is the correct answer. 400 is the correct answer. And understand, guys, Bill is the referee. He's going to he's going to look through the feed and he's going to see who was the first responder from Facebook and the first responder from YouTube. He will contact you, give you the contact, which is social at kicker.com. Right. We'll get your info. We'll send those T-shirts out to you so you can proudly wear these, hopefully, next Tuesday night when you tune in to watch Kicker Unmasked Live. Right. Now, next week's show, uh, and you never know, I actually like it. I'm, he's going to get tired of me asking because I no, really no, do. No, no. <laughs> I love having Ken come join us because Ken is one of the guys that travels the world literally and trains used to. people. Used, well, this Before year, this year. This year, <laughs> this year he is the slept exception. on the couch. <laughs> the, the exception, yeah. Do we, a lot of virtual training now, but we've every, done a lot of time. Yeah, you know what? We've been driving a lot of couches, and, and nobody's day drinking. No. <laughs> no. That, that we know of. No. But Ken is, uh, and before this, he did travel the world, and he will again when things you know, get right. back to what we want to call normal around here. But Ken is a key component here at Kicker. He's great at getting the information across, and I'm really proud to have him on the team, and I'm really thankful when he can come join us here on the show. Appreciate so I appreciate it, it Ken. Much. Thank you. Um, want to do a little wrap-up here? We're at the 90-minute mark, and as you guys know, I try to keep it at that. First thing is, Ernie, if you would throw, and I don't care what you put up on the screen, it could be the video, it can be the picture, it can be my ugly mug, but I'd prefer the picture of the video it's prettier than me. There we go. I like that one there. Remember, guys, this is the final week to go get your name in for the drawing for the quad box giveaway. Derek at Williston Audio Labs, he is the gentleman who helped us collab this together. He did a fantastic unboxing of that. I, I see that every time and I just have to chuckle. You know, Derek did a great job. He did an unboxing of it. He put it in his own vehicle. He's not an SPL guy. He even tells you that. And we're, we don't pull any punches. The quad box isn't an SPL just box. Just having it's, fun. That's it's what a, it's for. It's a fun demo box. I mean, if you ask Steve Irby why we did the quad box, his answer is, because I could. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's awesome. Give me yeah. one for that. That, that wasn't that. planned. I knew what the answer was. <laughs> but, you know, go hit Williston Audio Labs. Bill will throw the link up, I'm sure, one more time for you guys so you can grab that out of the feed. Check the video. Get your entries in. Remember, there's multiple ways to get more entries, so do them all. It increases your chances to win. Next Tuesday night, 7.30 Central Time, here on Kicker Unmasked Live, we will be announcing the winner of that contest. And, of course, there's like 12 other sub-prizes we'll be doing, so come along for those. Um, not sure what we're going to talk about next week's show besides the giveaway. I think that's going to take a lot of time, but we'll find some filler material, something that's cool or exciting. Yeah, we'll find some for sure. We've got a lot of cool stuff around here. We'll do something. Maybe we'll have some updates on the L7X, the Solo X. Yeah. Everybody's always excited to know about gotta that. Got to keep that hush. <laughs> got to keep that hush. But as always, Ken, thank you for joining us on the show. I appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thank you for having me. Thank all of you for joining us. As always, this is Kip. Tim, Jeremy, Ernie, and Bill Frog hiding out back somewhere answering questions. We're thankful you turned in. We sure appreciate it. Kicker Unmasked Live. It's every Tuesday night, 730 Central Time. Have a great week. We'll see you next one. Have a good one. Fantastic job, Tim. Appreciate it.